it was a striking plea for civility and unity. Congratulations, Mr. President. As he was sworn in as the 46th president, Joe Biden asked his opponents to give him a chance to heal the nation's wounds. Politics doesn't have to be a raging fire, destroying everything in its path. Unity is the path forward. And we must meet this moment as the United States of America. I Kamala Davy Harris, I solemnly swear that I will support if Mr. Biden's triumph was a reminder of the power of persistence, he was not the only history maker here today. Also on News at 10 tonight, Mr. Trump flies to Florida with a final message. I will be back. So just a goodbye. We love you. We will be back in some form. Have a good life. We will see you soon. Another horrible record at home with more than 1,800 dead. A danger to life evacuations as severe flood warnings hit the UK and... The stars are aligned from Lady Gaga to Springsteen, how music royalty is once again turning out for the president. From Washington, this is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening from America. President Joe Biden's America, a country he made crystal clear today that would be very different from that of his predecessor. Over and over in his inauguration address, Mr. Biden spoke of unity. My whole soul, he said, is committed to bringing America together. We must end this uncivil war. Without unity, there is chaos. He didn't mention President Trump by name. He didn't need to, nor, as it happens, did Mr. Trump mention Mr. Biden in his farewell speech, though, to be fair, he did wish the new administration good luck. As President Trump departed for Florida with a military send-off, he promised, or warned, depending on your point of view, we will be back in some form. But that, of course, depends on potential impeachment. Mr. Trump wasn't at the inauguration ceremony, of course, nor were the crowds because of coronavirus and because the whole area was sealed off after what happened here two weeks ago. The thousands of troops meant no violence after all. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the oath of office. Please raise your right hand. His is a story of profound resilience and persistence. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. Joe Biden, at the age of 78, was sworn in as America's 46th president. Will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. His hand on the family's immense 19th century Bible. So help you, God. So help me, God. Congratulations, Mr. Thank president. You. Joe Biden is embracing a single mission for his presidency. In his words, to heal a broken land. Today, we celebrate the triumph not of a candidate, but of a cause, the cause of democracy. The people, the will of the people has been heard, and the will of the people has been heeded. We've learned again that democracy is precious, democracy is fragile. And at this hour, my friends, democracy has prevailed. And to a nation that is weary to its soul with the ferocity of the political arguments, he had this message. Stop the shouting and lower the temperature. For without unity, there is no peace, only bitterness and fury. No progress, only exhausting outrage. No nation, only a state of chaos. This is our historic moment of crisis and challenge. And unity is the path forward. Perhaps the most striking moment of all 
was to witness the daughter of an Indian scientist and a Jamaican academic shattering a glass ceiling. I Kamala Davy Harris, I solemnly swear that I will And becoming America's first female vice president. The duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Oh, Lord. Her husband is now adopting the title of America's first second gentleman. To bring star power to a ceremony secured by 25,000 troops and held amid a pandemic. What so proudly we hailed. Lady Gaga stepped forward for the national anthem. Whose broad stripes and bright stars throw the perilous fight. Four hours earlier, Donald Trump left the White House for the final time. His wildly erratic presidency, inspiring to some and traumatic to others, was over. and he left behind a city breathing a collective sigh of relief. At Andrews Air Force Base on his way to Florida, with family members in tears, he summed up the four years of his presidency. I will always fight for you. I will be watching, I will be listening. So, have a good life. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then, with perhaps the best selected soundtrack in political history playing on the loudspeakers. And did it my way. He flew off to his golf resort in Florida. His last ride aboard Air Force One. The new president and vice president emerged from the capital, the very complex that two weeks ago had been stormed by an insurrectionary mob. Those chaotic scenes now replaced with pomp and pageantry. There was a somber final port of call for America's new leaders before they started work at the White House. The Commander-in-Chief paying tribute to the country's fallen. With questions already being asked about whether Joe Biden will find an exit strategy for America's longest war, the 20-year conflict in Afghanistan. The flags fluttering over the headstones in Arlington National Cemetery, a reminder of the cost of war. Amazing grace. Joe Biden today asked Americans to unite and to show civility. Politics doesn't have to be a raging fire, destroying everything in its path. Every disagreement doesn't have to be a cause for total war. I was, was but whether Trump's America is listening is an open question and may shape whether this presidency can help bring the country back from the brink. Robert Moore, News at 10, Washington. It was 50 years ago this very month that a young Joe Biden became an elected politician, a county councillor in Delaware in 33 since his first attempt to become president. He's waited a long time, to put it mildly, but he has hit the ground running. No sooner was he through the doors of the White House than he was overturning some of Mr. Trump's controversial policies on coronavirus, on the border wall, on the travel ban, uh, on people from mainly Muslim countries. His intray is overflowing. 
After half a century in politics, Joe Biden can finally call the White House home. He's now president, but it was as a husband, a father and a grandfather that he made the short walk to his new address. And even as president, his old style informality remained. Thank you. This is the end of a long journey. The last time he was here it was as vice president. Now the weight of office is on his shoulders. There had been no invitation from the last president to his successor, but that seemed to matter little to the new commander in chief and his first lady. Joe Biden fought his campaign, promising to unify the country. He begins his presidency in a country more divided than it's been in recent history. And the work to tackle domestic security, the coronavirus pandemic and the economy has already begun. Those who have worked with the president in transition are clear on his priorities. First and foremost, um, addressing the pandemic is a massive priority because it has so many implications on an economic level, you know, on a health level. Um, but I think the steps that he's taking today, you know, with repealing the Muslim ban, um, uh, outlining what a new immigration plan could look like, uh, but also rejoining the Paris Agreement and uh, WHO, all these steps are, are going to be his priorities and I think is an important first step for him to clearly signal that. Because we can choose to see that we've been connected all along. With the inauguration underway, the White House released a video of presidential priorities. An attempt to calm a nervous nation, to lay out the administration's aspirations. As he gets to work here at the White House, President Biden faces the challenge of his political career. He knows this country well, but it has changed much even in the last few weeks. If he is to be the aged saviour of this nation, he will need to deliver on his promise to govern for all. President Biden speaks of healing. His actions will now need to heal the health of this nation and its soul too. Emma Murphy, News at 10, Washington. And Robert is, of course, uh, with me to reflect on all this. Look, we were sitting here a short time ago, weren't we, listening to it? Civility, unity, unity, civility, the same message over and over again. Do you think he has a real chance of healing divisions here? Well, for those of us who were on the early sort of campaign trail with him, Tom, uh, through the primaries in early 2020, right through to the general election mm -hmm. in November, he struck many people as a deeply flawed candidate. But that said, today there is a, a strange sense that perhaps he is the right president for this time. His greatest political gift by some margin is empathy, perhaps derived from his own dealing and his own personal anguish when he lost his wife and daughter in a car crash and later his beloved son, Bo, uh, from brain cancer. And this is a country that's now just gone over the threshold of 400,000 people who have died from the pandemic and it's you know there is a sense that empathy is needed he's also a centrist and a bridge builder happy to work across the aisle and that might help him deal with this great political rift that confronts the country so maybe he is the right character for this moment and on the other side of the ledger it's difficult not to conclude that, that the presidency of Donald Trump has ended in almost a complete disgrace impeached twice by the house uh, facing trial in the Senate kicked off social media for his inflammatory messaging. You know, it does feel perhaps that his legacy is to further divide this country, shatter uh, the Republican Party. Um, and of course, in the coming days, it may be that he is convicted by the Senate and prevented from ever for running for federal office again. So, you know, it does feel that this is Joe Biden's moment in the sunlight, if you like, as these cascading crises are come to a fore here in the United States. OK, Robert, please stay there. We'll come back to you uh, for a final thought at the end of the programme. Now, the man who couldn't bring himself to be part of his successor's inauguration, as Robert was just referring to there, did at least follow one tradition and left Mr Biden a note inside the Oval Office. Contents secret. The mind boggles. As we saw earlier, he did set off from the White House long before the ceremony began for Florida, where John is tonight, across the lake from President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. Donald Trump's Air Force One came in over Mar-a-Lago. On this, its final, final approach. West Palm Beach Airport was touched down on this one-way trip. And as the minutes on his presidency counted down, 
Mr. Trump appeared determined to enjoy all the courtesies he could, having offered his successor none in return. We love our president. After the last flight came the last motorcade. He wants to go slow for everybody. The mood of celebration was at odds with his record as a one-term president who helped his party lose the Senate. For his devout supporters, those facts were neither here nor there. For them, this wasn't the end of an era, just an interlude. It's just going to be an amazing country once he gets back in office, in my opinion. I think he has a plan. I think he's going to be back in office. He's not down and out, not by a long shot. The drive was excruciatingly slow. With his power ebbing away, Mr. Trump savored and squeezed every last drop of privilege afforded him. Mar-a-Lago may be splendid, but by taking up permanent residency here, Mr. Trump could be in breach of a contract with Palm Beach Town Council. That's one home truth facing private citizen Trump, who, while hinting at a political comeback, will first have to address outstanding business loans and lawsuits. They are threats to his lifestyle and to his liberty. With the trappings of high office, including presidential immunity, now gone, Donald Trump will have to confront liabilities he simply can't hide from any longer, not even in splendid isolation. John Irvine, News at 10, Palm Beach in Florida. Back here in Washington, and among the group of VIP guests with a ringside seat at the ceremony was our very own ambassador to Washington, Dame Karen Pierce. After working with the Trump administration, the new Biden team might seem like something of a change. Certainly when I spoke to her a little earlier, before the sun had set here, she said she liked what she heard. Ambassador, thank you very much uh, for joining us. You have thank literally you. just come hot foot from the inauguration. Uh, what was it like? What did you make of it? Uh, I thought it was a very moving uh, occasion. It was a warm occasion, not literally, it was freezing, uh, yes. but it was a warm occasion because it was fundamentally uh, a ratification of American democracy uh, and a peaceful, orderly transition of power. And coming after the events on the Capitol, uh, that was very important for everyone, I think. Uh, I mean, I got the sense that perhaps the prevailing sentiment there on the, the, the steps of the Capitol building was really relief, actually, that the tumultuous Trump years were finally over. I think that was some people's reaction, to be honest. My, myself, I thought the mood in Washington had lifted. I thought it was pretty subdued before the Capitol events, uh, and then it was shocked and outraged, as were we. And I, I really had the sense that the mood was lifting, and you know, the sun very fortunately broke through the clouds, so there was a good metaphor there. Uh, but I think people came away a lot more optimistic. What difference is a Biden administration going to make to all of us? Uh, I think the emphasis on allies, uh, the emphasis on consultation, uh, the emphasis on getting the international system uh, back in good working order under American leadership, I think that's the tone. Uh, there'll be a real focus on climate. Biden will bring America back into the Paris climate agreement, and that in turn will raise levels of ambition. There was a sense we wanted to do a trade deal before the last administration went out on the grounds that it might be tougher with a new administration. Uh, we still want to do that trade deal. We never set ourselves a, a deadline. So we'll be talking to the new administration about the prospects for that deal and seeing if we can get it through early this year. Do you think our political leaders should have done a bit more to distance themselves from the last president, particularly given where his presidency ended up, which, let's face it, is where a lot of people always said it would end up? Uh, well, America is Britain's closest ally and, and has been for decades. It's within uh, Britain's interest to have such a strong relationship, particularly the bedrock of security and intelligence. But you, um, but you don't think now, when you look back with the benefit of hindsight, the current prime minister has gone out of his way to praise Trump, uh, you know, for the Biden administration coming in, that's what they're looking at, right? Uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, we do speak out and did speak out against President Trump uh, when we thought his policies were wrong uh, on Iran, on, on climate, uh, on some of the so-called social issues around Black Lives Matter. And most recently, the Prime Minister was very critical of what happened at the Capitol and of President Trump's role in that. Ambassador, thank you very much indeed for taking the trouble to join us today of all days. Thank you.
Dame Karen Pierce, our ambassador to the US, talking to me a little earlier. Time for some other news now, but we'll have more on the inauguration later in the program. And back home, I'm sorry to say, it has been another simply terrible day for coronavirus deaths. Very sadly, 1,800 more were announced today. Once again, that is the highest yet. The Prime Minister called the figure appalling. Since the pandemic began, he has been keen to stress cabinet unity over what are undoubtedly very tough decisions. But a recording has come to light of the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, saying the UK's borders should have been closed earlier, and in fact she was pushing for it back in March. A second wave that's proving more brutal than the first, the number of deaths rising ever higher. And tonight the Prime Minister admitted the worst is yet to come. These figures are appalling, and of course, they. Uh, it, we think of the the suffering that uh, each one of those uh, deaths represents to their to their families, to their to their friends. It looks as though the the rates of infection in the country overall uh, may now be uh, be peaking or flattening, but they're not flattening very fast. Could more lives have been saved, though? The family of Tony Clay, a grandfather from Yorkshire who died in the first wave, thinks so. He caught Covid in March, returning from France, where he was living, when there were no border controls and no advice against such travel. If there had been, his daughter says he would never have risked it. I'm angry. My, my dad could still be alive. He was only 60 when he died. He was a young and fit and healthy man um, and he still had many years left to live. Um, the fact that, you know, decisions like that were taken so lightly or the wrong decisions were made and it cost not just my dad's life but, you know, thousands of people's lives. Extraordinarily, it seems the Home Secretary agrees. In a secret recording of her talking to Tory supporters released today, she said this. Should we close our borders early? The answer is yes. Um, I was mad because to close them last March. In the Commons, Labour seized on the apparent Cabinet split over the issue. Why did he overrule the Home Secretary, who claims that she said last March that we should shut our borders? Mr Speaker, we've instituted one of the toughest border regimes in the world and it was only last March that he, along with many others in his party, uh, were continuing to support uh, an open border approach. But would shutting the borders in March actually have worked? This epidemiologist says it was already too late. The infection was already very well established in the UK in March. To make a substantial difference to the spread of infection, it would have had to be probably early February or even late January. Questions, no doubt, for the inquiry when it comes. Meanwhile, the NHS battles on. Libby Vina, News at 10, Westminster. Well, after that record number of deaths, it might feel like the virus is winning the race against the vaccines. But the number of people to have their first jab has edged up to 46 million. There were just over a third of a million injections yesterday, but the daily rate does need to increase above that to meet the government's February the 15th target for all the top priority groups. After yet more heavy rain today, floodwaters in Greater Manchester are expected to peak in about half an hour's time. Tonight, there are more than 120 flood warnings, which means immediate action is required. Most are in a large band across much of northern and central England. And there are now also four severe flood warnings, including two in Didsbury in Greater Manchester, meaning a danger uh, to life. Police say they are evacuating people there. Well, Ben Chapman is in Didsbury. Uh, ben, can you just fill us in on the picture there? Well, the snow is coming down in Manchester, but it's the extremely swollen River Mersey behind me which is causing the most concern. Enough that police have begun to order an evacuation of those properties most at risk this evening in the last half an hour or so, uh, saying that a large number of officers are being deployed to areas in Didsbury alongside the fire service to support that evacuation. I have to say, with our own eyes, we haven't seen much evidence of that 
so far this evening and speaking to residents living very close to the river they haven't been told they're still in the dark whether they should leave or not certainly for the police's part and the local council uh, they're saying that people who are told to evacuate really should do so in spite of the covid lockdown rules they should stay with local friends and family if they can although covid secure temporary accommodation is also being provided and a little while ago greater manchester police told us why and told us how bad things could get tonight at its peak uh, we, we've had just short of or around 3,000 homes that come within the sort of worst case uh, scenario uh, mapping areas uh, it should the flood be at its worst so what we're trying to do is work with the local authority to contact the uh, individuals involved uh, who may be impacted by this Two more severe flood warnings, meaning a danger to life, have also been issued tonight in Maghull in Merseyside. This river is expected to peak at around 11 o'clock, an anxious night ahead for a lot of people who've been in the path of this storm, Christoph. OK, Ben, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's move on to the court case brought by Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, against the publishers of The Mail on Sunday. A lawyer for the newspaper group says he had received a letter suggesting four former members of the Sussex's staff may be able to shed some light on Meghan's handwritten letter to her father, which is, you will recall, at the heart of the case. Meghan is suing for damages because she says the letter was private and extracts of it should simply not have been published. Associated News Newspapers claim Meghan wrote the letter with a view to it being disclosed publicly at some point in the future. Finally tonight, a change of president means a change of tune for some of America's biggest musicians and pop stars. Many have kept their distance from the Trump presidency, their politics often, of course, diametrically opposed to his. But for Joe Biden, they have come rushing back. As we saw, Lady Gaga and Jennifer Lopez, and they don't get too much bigger than that, were giving it plenty for Joe. And not just international superstars, some of America's young bands want to be part of the new political era too. This land was made for you and me. His inauguration events have been star-studded. Jennifer Lopez performing today. Later, Bruce Springsteen and Foo Fighters will take to the stage. But musicians have been taking part in broadcasts for Joe Biden all week. Permanent. Here I am. US band AJR, three brothers whose music has been streamed billions of times worldwide, performed in the We The People concert. 2016, we went to the White House to play for Joe Biden for one of his last days in office um, to support a nonprofit organization that he and Barack Obama started. And now for it to come full circle and for us to come back and participate in his, you know, becoming president, it was an amazing honor. And we're so thankful and excited for, uh, you know, for him to be president. Let's go out with a bang. bang, bang, bang. Here we go. It's not the first time the trio, with their young following, has been asked to play for an incoming president. There were reports of so many musicians uh, refusing to perform at Donald Trump's inauguration. We were one of them. It was a very, very quick no. Um, it, well, we obviously laughed and then we said no. Um, but what happened was we realized, we were like, wait, and this was for, obviously it was four or five years ago, back before we really had any of the success. And we're like, wait, why is he coming to us? And then we realized that he sort of went down the A-list a artists. So they said no, then the B, and then he kind of got down to the Ds with us. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, that's probably why. We've always made the choice. Let's just, you know, say what we feel and take a side and try to be remembered on what we think is the right side of history. Why does he appeal to young people? Probably one of the big reasons that Joe Biden was elected yeah. <laughs> is because young people kind of came out and, and did their part. He wasn't originally campaigning on a big, you know, climate change platform, but he saw that that was really important and vital to the young people especially. And so he listened to what people care about. And that's so rare in politics. It is never easy to hit the right note with everyone, but it is clear the new president is already in tune with some who can help him reach a vast and powerful audience. Nina Nana, News at 10. OK, well, it was quite a day, as we always said it would be, so let's get some final thoughts from Robert here. Look, Mr Trump has left the stage. Who knows whether he'll be back? It's been a roller coaster four years. What are your sort of reflections, finally, at the end of today? 
Well, I think you and I both saw it today. We, there is a, a real sense that the political establishment is back in charge in this town, that the insurgent has been exiled to Florida. But I think there's also awareness that you know, no one should be naive about this. The political fury in this country amongst many uh, alienated voters is still there. Conspiracy theories that Trump has propagated are still being weaponized across social media, even if he is now a much more isolated figure. So the political peril uh, for America is still very present. I think the other takeaway that we all get from this is, although, of course, we have concentrated on Joe Biden, the focus of today, in retrospect, may be on somebody else altogether, namely Kamala Harris. You know, she has real star power. She is a symbol of America's diversity. And this is a town that always looks forward to the next election, to the next great political talent. And I think Kamala, uh, Kamala Harris now becomes an incredibly influential figure, not only because she breaks the tie in the Senate, but because she has real star power and is potentially going to be the, the America's first woman uh, president. So that's quite a thing today. And I think maybe we've focused on Joe Biden, but Kamala Harris is the next big thing. OK, Robert, you heard it here. Thank you very much. Now, that is more or less all we have time for at the close of what has been, honestly, a fascinating day. Joe Biden has spent a political lifetime waiting for this moment. And tonight, he has finally realized his longed-for destiny. And there he is, inside the White House. But what a moment in the life of this country it has turned out to be, with multiple overlapping crises, the pandemic, its effect on the economy, unresolved racial tension, and a fractured country. But as we heard from Mr. Biden today, he has a fierce determination to unite. That was echoed during the ceremony by a young poet, Amanda Gorman. America isn't broken, she wrote, but simply unfinished. We leave you with her words. From us, good night. Thanks for watching. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it.